The Catskill region covers an area of 3.8 million acres. The Catskill Park Preserve covers 700,000 of those 3.8 million acres. 300,000 acres of those 700,000 acres, 41% of the land within the boundaries of the Park Preserve, have been designated forever wild by an amendment to the New York State Constitution. New York City owns in fee simple or easement around 100,000 acres of its 1,014,000 acre watershed that drains into the six reservoirs which supply clean, potable, unfiltered water to 10 million New York City area residents. New York State owns a few tens of thousands of additional acres of multi-use forest land within the Catskill region. Nevertheless, 88% of the region's land area is privately owned. The film, Parcelizing the Catskills and the Boiled Frog Syndrome, is a sensitively orchestrated symposium of interviews, richly illustrated with moving and still images, both current and historical. A broad spectrum of land use, land cover experts provide an illuminating and diverse commentary that probes the environmental effects of a modest but steadily growing development trend in the region, largely driven by a dramatically increasing land consumption and population growth from the New York City metropolitan area. Is this enough protected land in the Catskill region? No, no, it's not enough protected land. And the reason why it's not enough is because if you look at the location of the Catskills, it's strategically located within great proximity of New York City, as well as the, the Pennsylvania border and some of the cities, the urban areas there, as well as, as New Jersey. It has often been a playing field for many of the urban folks that live, um, and, and millions and millions of folk that live within very close proximity. And when I say that, it's a two-hour drive. I myself do it two, three times a week in a single day there and back. Is the Catskill region a unique ecosystem? This is one of the last places where we feel it would be possible to preserve northern hardwood forest ecosystems at a scale large enough to be meaningful. So for example, for us, uh, when we look at interior uh, bird species, forest bird species, uh, we know that they require a habitat of a minimum of 15,000 acres of unfragmented forest to have habitat that's adequate to um, house, let's say, 25 breeding pairs of a species of birds. So when you think about that, um, in northern hardwood forest systems across New York State, there aren't going to be very many opportunities to have large intact forests large enough that we can say 100 years from now or 200 years from now that there's a likelihood that those species will be able to survive. Forests in the Catskill Mountain region are basically the filters uh, for the New York City drinking water supply. So, for example, right off the bat, the first thing you think of is there's 9 million people that are drinking the water that flow out of the forest in the Catskills. So, uh, while some people look at a forest um, in the Catskills as a empty or undeveloped piece of property, uh, we could look at it and say it's a huge biological filter that's providing that water service. It is the largest in the world of an unfiltered water supply and because of that it's critical that there be limited amount of impervious surface in the watershed. As forests grow they, they capture carbon from the atmosphere. It's just a myriad of, of uh, first of all wood products that come from the forests um, not to mention things like maple syrup the wood products industry in New York is probably about a $4 billion a year industry when times are good. In the southern part of Sullivan County, the amount of growth that happened in the last 10 years was phenomenal. And, and how the, the communities changed uh, because of the influx of people moving in and, and developments springing up all over the place. And, and there was no really, uh, no effort taken to plan for where the development should happen and, and uh, where it shouldn't. Development is one of the threats that, that continues to be identified in the Catskills. Uh, most of the predictions that I've looked at indicate that it's um, a subtle development. It's a, it's a fairly slow 1% uh, forest conversion rate per year, which, um, which could double at 1% a year. We're talking about a doubling rate of about 70 years. Right. So. If you're looking at the long term, 200, 300 years out, 
don't we need to be concerned about a 1% growth rate in parcelization, subdivision, exurbanization, call it what you will? I think 1% um, is, a, is a very tricky number because it happens slow enough that people get comfortable with it. But when you, as you've suggested, when you project it out into the longer term, um, I think it's a, that's a very significant number. All the forest and everything was beautiful here, the beautiful rivers and that. You know, some of those things are still here, but we're losing them through the subdivision of this area because now you're going to see trailers and jump cars and developments and communities that, that really don't belong on this land. People saying that it has to be publicly owned to be well taken care of, that's not true. I think private landowners, uh, by and large, um, are the reason, for example, why New York City didn't have to build a fil filtration plant. That private land is contributing to both the environmental and economic stewardship of the Catskills. Uh, and I think the way that we, for example, levy taxes on that private land tends to drive it towards more developed uses. I am concerned that development and subdivision and, and set parceling off farms will continue to happen because farmers can't make a living farming. When agriculture is devalued by imports or water subsidies, it's peop, farmland is being lost because the real value to society is not being transferred into monetary value. They wouldn't, farms wouldn't be sold if people were making money on their farms. There's grave concern over the, over the farm industry and the loss of farmers. Well, farmers are what make up, uh, they've been the stewards of the land all these years. But coming together with marketing agricultural products, be they dairy or otherwise, uh, in this metropolitan area, uh, I would challenge the city of New York to step up and help as much as possible as they can. What I'm asking that's new is to ask the city to get more involved in the development of a market for dairy products in the, in the Catskill Mountain region. If the farmers to go out, we're, gonna, we're going to um, have more imported products into this country. I seen a sign not so long ago that said that if, if you like foreign oil and the cost of it, wait till you see what food's going to cost you. So in some ways, we have to protect the farmer, and we have to not allow all these imports and uh, uh, enable him somehow to get his cost of production. Uh, because you're right, uh, he can only hold out so much longer, and... Uh, then he's through. And I think the average age of a farmer is 58 to 60 years old. And you can't entice the young people to get into that business. Second home development has a couple impacts. The primary one, from my perspective, is the parcelization of, of existing land. And a lot of that land is forest land. And there are two impacts from parcel parceling forest land. Number one is the impact on the habitat, the environment, the, the ability of the forest to carry out the functions that a, that a large tract of, of forest land does. And the second is what I talked about earlier, the economic impact. It's just much more difficult to sustain a forestry industry on smaller parcels because of the cost of the administrative cost of making arrangements for harvesting and the, and the uh, small size of the harvest that occurs there. Every local jurisdiction in New York State has the authority and the responsibility to plan for their town, village, or city. Um, and each of them typically go through what's called a you know, local planning process, a comprehensive plan. The number one response guaranteed by town, town by town, all over um, the Catskills, or for, for that matter of fact, probably most in New York, will be that they want to preserve the rural nature of their community. Um, then when you try to attempt to quantify or define what the rural nature of a community in is, that's where it becomes uh, quite uh, complex. We want to continue the way of life that we have. We want cottage industries, value-added industries, and farming. That's, that's the backbone. And so of you want the same thing that environmentalists want, except you don't want the control. government to oversee all right. of this. You want yeah. this to be in private hands. Is that, is yeah. that the difference? Exactly. To be right. in if, if we hands. happen to build a couple extra houses this year, we don't need the government to tell us that you're really, you're, you're really uh, overbuilding in your area and you have to slow it down. This is not, again, it's not going to be Rockland or Westchester County. We will not have that kind of growth here. The greatest threats to the ecosystem that I can personally comment on because of my own research is that 
we found a very, very high correlation between the loading of phosphorus, nitrogen, total dissolved phosphorus, soluble reactive phosphorus, nitrate, nitrite. We found very high correlation between those those different nutrients and impervious surface. It wasn't even something we were expecting in our analysis. Um, although we know that impervious surface in much more developed areas is, is of great concern in terms of water quality. But in all of our statistical analyses, which we have done and redone because there were so many doubters of our uh, results, um, it was impervious surface that was the most explanatory factor. All the parts of the community derive from healthy rural landscapes. And New York City watershed is obviously a huge, the biggest example in the whole world. What is that worth to the residents of New York City? Well, you can't even put a monetary value on it. And that applies to all rural landscapes. So, but the, the challenge is we don't really account for those ecological services as they're being called now. Water quality, air quality, you know, farms, local food, some local energy. We don't really account for those in our economic equations. There is a reason to be alarmed. If you look at um, another great resource, the Regional Planning Association has come up with what they consider to be 10 mega regions in the country that will see the impact of the 100 million people that will be added to this country by 2050. A large portion of that 100 million people, about 18 million, will be coming to the Northeast Mega Region. And most of those will be in the urban areas. Have you ever heard of the boiled frog syndrome? No. If you drop a frog in a beaker of boiling water, it will frantically attempt to escape if it doesn't immediately boil to death. But if you place a frog in a beaker of lukewarm water, and heat it gradually over a period of several hours, the frog will become too complacent or too weak to escape and ultimately boils to death. The so-called boiled frog syndrome, a metaphor for the complacency of humans to tolerate negative changes to their environment, provided that those changes occur gradually enough to become imperceptible.